it can be tempting to look at pets as being totally separate from wild animals. We go to a pet store and see birds, fish, reptiles, and amphibians, and we can forget that all of these animals have a wild origin. In fact, many species of animal found in pet stores are still collected directly from the wild. In today's video, we're looking at the interesting wild origins of three common pets, the axolotl, the crested gecko, and the Bengay cardinal. And we'll see how animals we take for granted as common pets can actually have a tragic story of loss and extinction in the wild. Welcome back to All About Nature. On my channel, I try to bring nature-related content that's both educational and entertaining. If you enjoy this kind of content, then please consider liking the video, leaving a comment, or even subscribing to the channel. Before we get started, I need to say a special thanks to my patrons, whose ongoing support allows me to make videos weekly. If you want to join us on Patreon, check out the link in the video description below. Now, let's get into the video. When the Aztecs settled in the Valley of Mexico in the 13th century, they found a large, strange salamander in the lakes and waterways of the region. It was brown or tan and generally grew to about 25 centimeters long. Unlike other salamanders, this species didn't normally undergo the final metamorphosis into the adult salamander form, so it remained bound to the water, using its frilled external gills to breathe. They named it Axolotl, after Zolotl, their god of fire and lightning. It played an important role in Aztec society, not only being part of the legends of the region, but also regularly ending up on people's plates as they were commonly consumed. When the Spanish arrived about three centuries later, they likely saw plenty of axolotls still thriving in the lake around the Aztec capital. But by the 17th century, the city was expanding and regular flooding from the lake was making life in the capital difficult. The Spanish decided to drain the lake around the city, effectively destroying the primary habitat of the axolotl. At the end of the 17th century, the axolotl was scientifically described, and within a few decades, the first axolotls were taken to Paris, where Europeans became obsessed with the strange salamander they began to breed the species domestically, and the different color variations of the species began to become more and more favorable. The most impressive thing about axolotls is their amazing regenerative abilities. Instead of healing by scarring like many other animals do, they can regenerate limbs, parts of organs, and even small damages to their brains. This has led to them being heavily researched by scientists who want to understand how the axolotls do this and how it might be used to benefit people. Today, axolotls are still popular pets around the world. There are likely over a million being kept in captivity, but the wild population hasn't been so prosperous. In their remaining habitat around Mexico City, numerous surveys have been done to track their numbers. In 1998, about 6,000 axolotls per square kilometer were recorded. Ten years later, that number was down to 100. Today, there are estimated to be fewer than 1,000 axolotls holding on in the wild. As Mexico City continues to expand, the few bodies of water that still hold wild axolotls are becoming more and more polluted. And to make matters worse, Invasive species like tilapia and carp have been introduced, and they quickly consume the axolotls before they have a chance to develop. Modern axolotl conservation programs seek to encourage farmers to change the way they use water so that some of their canals can be converted into axolotl breeding territory. But it may be too little too late for the remaining wild population. New Caledonia is a French island territory in the South Pacific that's home to an amazing variety of endemic species. They're particularly well known for their numerous gecko species, including the world's largest, the New Caledonian gecko. 
In the mid-19th century, French zoologist Antoine Alphonse Guichenot was performing a survey on New Caledonia when he stumbled on a new species of gecko. It was relatively large, being as much as 25 centimeters long. It also had hair-like projections above the eyes, which resembled eyelashes, as well as two rows of spines, which ran the length of the body, from the eyes to the base of the tail. This animal would come to be commonly known as the New Caledonian Crested Gecko. He only found a few specimens, and they were sent off to France. In 1866, an article was published describing the new species. It was given the Latin name ciliatus, which means fringe or eyelashes. But after their initial discovery, the crested geckos were not seen again. It wasn't until 1994 that the species would be rediscovered. A tropical storm swept through New Caledonia, destroying parts of the forest and dislodging animals from the canopy. This is when herpetologist Robert Sape came across some strange geckos jumping among the fallen debris. It was soon realized that these were the ciliatus geckos that hadn't been seen for nearly 150 years. Some live crested geckos were collected for research, and over the coming years, many more were collected from the wild for the international pet trade, as geckos were becoming popular pets. But the government of New Caledonia realized that over-harvesting for the pet trade was damaging the small remaining wild population, and an international ban on the trade of wild New Caledonian crested geckos was put in place. Today, crested geckos are the second most kept gecko species in captivity, with millions being kept as pets around the world. In the wild, they only have three known color morphs, patternless, white fringed, and tiger. But in captivity, they have been bred to have dozens of different colorations. In the wild, their population size isn't known. They live in three disconnected populations, two on the southern tip of the main island of New Caledonia, and one on the small Isle of Pines. Living high in the canopy, they are very hard to study, and most of what we know about the species today has been gleaned by captive populations. They lay clutches of two eggs, just like every other species of New Caledonian gecko. They can be kept together peacefully, and they are very long-lived. How long-lived is not yet known, as we've only been keeping them extensively in captivity for the past 20 years or so, with many geckos surpassing 20 years of age. Today, their biggest threats in the wild are from introduced fire ants, which can attack and kill the geckos, and from the ongoing illegal capture and international trade of wild crested geckos. Off the east coast of Sulawesi, in Indonesia, lies a small group of islands known as the Bangai Archipelago. The islands are a lush green paradise surrounded by turquoise waters and rich coral reefs. Among the plethora of marine fish species is a fish that can only be found here, the Bangai Cardinal. Cardinals are a family of fish that include about 370 species. They're often small and brightly colored. They're nocturnal. They live in groups, and they brood their eggs in their mouths. In 1933, the Bangai Cardinal was scientifically described from a fish caught in a net, and it differed from other cardinals in a few ways. For one, rather than having bright colors, the species is mainly silver, with striking black and white stripes and spots, with the white bordering on iridescent blue. They also have elongated and forked fins, which add to their striking appearance. And it's the only known species of cardinal fish that's fully diurnal. If you were to go snorkeling or diving in the waters around the Bangai Islands, you would likely come across these fish in impressive groups, diving in and out of the spines of large sea urchins. The species is strongly associated with long-spined sea urchins, where as many as 60 fish can use a single urchin for protection. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, 
advances in our understanding of how to keep tropical marine fish alive in captivity grew. Fish from coral reefs began to be kept in the home aquarium more and more. By the 1990s, it was a major industry, and the popularity of the hobby continues to grow. In 1994, the Bangai Cardinal was observed in its natural habitat for the first time by a scientist. Ichthyologist Gerald Allen knew immediately that the cardinals were bound to become popular in the aquarium trade. Within a year, local fishermen were scooping them out of the ocean to ship off primarily to Europe and North America. By 2001, about 2,000 were being taken from the reefs daily amounting to 700,000 fish annually. They had become the holy grail of marine aquarium fish, and fishermen were making good money off the small cardinals. Between 1995 and 2005, the Bangai cardinal fish population crashed by 90%. Fishermen were traveling to more and more remote places in search of the fish, but it turned out that they had a very small range. The cardinals can only be found around 27 islands in the archipelago, and the total range of the species is smaller than the U.S. state of Rhode Island. One of the main problems with the marine aquarium fish trade is that 95% of the species will not breed in captivity. This means that almost every fish sold to hobbyists has to be caught in the wild. But Bangai cardinals are an exception. Because they live slow, still lives and brood their eggs in their mouths, they will readily breed in captivity. Yet, this hasn't stopped the ongoing capture of wild fish for the pet trade. Today, there are fewer than 1.5 million Bangai cardinals left on the reefs around the Bangai Islands. The few people that still fish them only make about 5 cents per fish. Yet, fishing continues the species is listed as endangered by the IUCN. Interestingly, because of how common they are in the pet trade, the species has been introduced to a few other places. Small, wild populations can now be found around Sulawesi and Bali in Indonesia. But without significant bans on the capture of wild fish, the Bangai Cardinal may soon only exist in the aquarium trade. And that's it for today's video. Do you know of any other pets that have interesting stories? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.